So I'm honored um, and delighted to be introducing a very distinguished and extraordinary Cornelian. Professor uh, Lobeval is the Stephen and Madeline Unbinder <coughs> Professor of History, also the Vice Provost of International Affairs, and the Director of the Mario Inaudi Center for International Studies. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, for The Embers of War, which is a fascinating and engrossing read. Um, it's about the conflict that preceded uh, America's uh, entrance into the Vietnam War. Uh, this is a beautiful book, and I've heard other historians refer to it as unfair. It's so good that it's unfair. <laughs> He has a full um, biography that you could read um, in your packet. Um, so in the interest of time, I'd just like to ask you to hold your questions until the end. Um, and please uh, welcome me, uh, please welcome me in introducing Professor Lobeval. Well, I thank you for that, Dave, and it's nice to be with me, uh, with you. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to project in case, in case I have two, not one, but two mics. And I hope that um, you will be able to hear me. Um, as Dave said, we are going to have time for questions. Uh, and I look forward to that, um, in, maybe in particular with the subject that I'm going to be talking about today. But I'm here, uh, and I've never said this before at a talk, I'm here as a Cornell parent because <laughs> Because I do, in fact, when I was wearing my tag last night, it said P17. And it took me just a second to realize what that meant. But I do have a daughter who's here at Cornell now. Uh, she's a freshman. And um, I'm also here uh, as a member of the history department, a professor in history. And I'm here as vice provost for international affairs, as Dave said. And I would love on a different occasion to talk with you in particular about what we're doing and what I think we need to be doing to, to strengthen, to further strengthen Cornell's international dimension, because I think we have a, a, a crucial task as a university, absolutely crucial task at Cornell, and that is to, to produce graduates who have, when they finish at Cornell, cross-cultural awareness, who are, if you'll pardon the cliche, global citizens, because I think it's imperative in this smaller world in which we live, this more interconnected world, that we have such graduates and that Cornell produce, that we, that, that we have people who finish at Cornell, young men and women who can navigate in this world, who can get jobs, who can have careers in what I think is going to be an inter uh, increasingly international uh, workplace. And so we're doing various things uh, all across the university and all of the colleges that I think are really exciting. Um, and I'm tempted now just to continue with this theme, but I won't, because it's not the subject for today. Um, but, but if you're interested, I'd love to speak with you individually. I'm just an email away, or a phone call away, to talk about uh, Global Cornell, as we call it. And there was a reference briefly last night to David Scorton's um, achievements at the reception, if you were there, achievements as, presidents, uh, as president. And one of them was that he has uh, helped to um, boost to, to reinvigorate uh, our international efforts. And I'm very grateful to David for that. And I think, among other things, I hope that our next president, David's successor, will have that same commitment to the international dimension of the university. Today, though, this morning, I'm going to talk with you about something else, which is American exceptionalism. It's a subject that I think has existed in the United States in one form or another since the nation's founding. I think it still has a powerful resonance with a great many Americans, a great many voters um, today. Um, arguably, it's waning a little bit. We can discuss that. But it's basically this, that the United States, in its governance, its institutions, in institutions, its mission and place in the world is, in a, world, in a word, exceptional. And in its most extreme version, this argument is not only that it's exceptional, but it's qualitatively superior to other nations. So for the last two and a half centuries, going back to the nation's founding, and indeed before, to some extent, there has been an argument that Americans, and then the United States, um, 
that the United States is an, is an empire of liberty, and you've heard all these phrases. So here are some of the ones that we have used and that uh, politicians still use. An empire of liberty, a shining city on a hill, the last best hope on earth, the leader of the free world, and the indispensable nation. And I'll come back at the conclusion of our, my remarks to the indispens and indispensable nation uh, notion. I think these enduring tropes explain why all presidential candidates feel compelled to offer ritualistic praise to America's greatness. And it also, they, they, they also help explain why President Obama got himself in a little bit of hot water early in his first term when he said, and you may remember this, so this was I think early in 09, he said that he believed in American exceptionalism. But he also believed in British exceptionalism, uh, Greek exceptionalism, and other countries' uh, brands of patriotic flag waving. And he got in trouble for, those, for that assertion. What's less well remembered is what he said after that in the very same speech. Uh, Obama went on to list in that speech features that in his view make the United States exceptional. And I quote the President, I think that we have a core set of values that are enshrined in our Constitution, in our body of law, in our democratic practices, in our belief in free speech and equality, that though imperfect, are exceptional. And I'm going to come back to this notion as well. I became a, citi I became a citizen of the United States uh, in 2008, uh, and I want to I talk in a few minutes about um, those features that Obama mentioned. Most recently, during the crisis over Syria, you'll remember there was, a, uh, there was a, an intense debate back in September, in particular, of last year about the prospect of an America, American military intervention in Syria. Um, Obama said as follows during that discussion. And again, I quote, terrible things happen across the globe, and it is beyond our means to right every wrong, but when, with modest effort and risk, we can stop children from being gassed to death and thereby make our own children safer over the long run, I believe we should act. That's what makes America different. That's what makes us exceptional. With humility, but with resolve, let us never lose sight of that essential truth." Unquote. So this is what we often mean by American exceptionalism. The term does have real intellectual grounding, as used by scholars. And by the way, there is a hot and heavy debate among historians, which is my discipline, about the notion of American exceptionalism in U.S. history. But as used by scholars, it refers to the ways the United States has differed historically from other countries. Uh, and in particular, I think the older nation states of Europe. The fact that it was founded, the United States was founded on a cluster of ideas, that it lacked a class-based social order with, hereditary, with a hereditary ruling class at the top, and that it attracted immigrants from all over the world. In a book um, that Campbell Craig and I published in, in 2009, which is titled America's Cold War, in that book, uh, Campbell and I argue that it also has a geographic component, this exceptionalism. We suggest uh, that a term that a, a Yale historian named uh, C. Van Woodward uh, coined, which is called, uh, which is free security. We suggest in the, in the book that free security uh, matters. The settlers who came from Europe to North America established themselves in a vast, sparsely populated landmass, one lavishly endowed in terms of natural resources and navigable rivers, and protected, this uh, Campbell Craig and I argue is critical, protected by two vast moats, the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. And so there is a geographic uh, uh, advantage, if you will. Moreover, along, all, along these same lines, the United States was fortunate to have weak neighbors on either side, with all due respect to Canadians uh, and Mexicans. <laughs> and these conditions, I spent years in Canada, and my sister lives in Canada, I love the place, but 
<laughs> I'm getting myself in trouble here. I think. Uh, stop digging, I guess is the phrase. Um, but these conditions, Campbell, Craig, and I argue in the book, allowed the country to develop differently. And it conditioned its responses, America's responses, to international conflict in profoundly important ways. Now, in American politics, the term exceptionalism has come to have a celebratory as well as analytical meaning, as I suggested at the outset. Uh, it refers to what makes the United States special, its wealth, its power, the economic opportunity it has provided for its citizens, and the expansive role it has played in the world, including the example of liberty and prosperity that it has set. One of the questions that I want to pose to you this morning is whether Americans still believe in this idea. And we could do an interesting poll uh, here among all of you. Not too long ago, the Washington Post um, argued in a headline that American exceptionalism is on the decline. <coughs> And it pointed to a Pew poll, uh, which measured opinion about American culture. And Pew determined in that poll that 49% of Americans think that the United States is superior, which was down from 2005, uh, I'm sorry, down from 60% in 2005. So 49%, uh, I think this was in 2012, uh, maybe 13, uh, down to 49 from 60. I'm a little skeptical, however, of this figure. Um, I think that um, Gallup maybe had a better uh, uh, sense of things. Um, there's a Gallup poll, this one is from early 2012, which found that 80% of Americans, because it all depends, as you know, on how you phrase the question in, in polls, 80% of Americans believe that the United States quote, has a unique character because of its history and constitution that sets it apart from other nations as the greatest in the world, unquote. 80%. Whether we're talking 80 or maybe it's 70, maybe it's, you know, somewhere in between these two figures, um, it's not surprising, I think, at least to me, that presidential candidates, if we focus on them for a moment, will every four years uh, offer these ritualistic praises to American uh, culture, to American politics, and it won't surprise us that, therefore, in 2012, to focus for a few minutes on that election, Republican presidential candidates spent a good deal of oxygen and printer ink um, decrying Obama, President Obama for not believing in their judgment in American exceptionalism. These Republican candidates might have been surprised to learn that President Obama has talked more about American exceptionalism than all of his uh, three or four predecessors combined. Now, there's an easy explanation for this that some of you have already, I think, identified, which is that the word itself is relatively new. So it doesn't matter perhaps that much that Obama is, uh, is using it. It was not one that, say, Ronald Reagan might have been aware of or even used or other Americans at the time um, were um, tossing about. Um, but these earlier presidents certainly endorsed the notion, even if they were not um, uh, actually articulating the word itself. But the point is, I think, that the, the concept remains very strong. The belief in, in the concept remains very strong in the United States today. But what should we make of it? That's maybe where I want to spend most of my time uh, this morning. How much substance is there to the argument that America's values, political system, and, hi and history are unique um, and, more to the point, worthy of universal admiration? How much should we accept the argument that the United States is both destined and entitled to play a distinct and positive role on the world stage? Reasonable people can differ on these questions, and as you will hear, for the remainder of my presentation, I myself uh, um, am somewhat ambivalent, or at least I have differing um, uh, notions in my own mind about this. To a degree, I accept the notion. I think, to go back to Obama's quote, that there is a core set of values that are enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, in the U.S. body of law, in American democratic practices, uh, in the belief 
in the United States in free speech and equality, that again, as he said, though they are imperfect, are uh, exceptional in the sense of qualitatively different. There's a very important distinction that one can make, by the way, that scholars often uh, debate, which is exceptional as in different versus exceptional as in superior. But I would even go a little bit farther, put myself out on a limb, and endorse at least to a degree this notion of superiority. And, and I mentioned earlier that I became a citizen in 2008, and it was just intensely moving for me to be at the Ithaca Courthouse in a way that I hadn't expected, and to see uh, my wife and kids sitting there in the, in the benches while uh, Fred, while, while I and about 50 other people rep representing, I think, about 27 different countries. It's an extraordinary different, uh, uh, extraordinary array of countries represented. But we took that oath to become citizens. Um, and I reflected sitting there in my uh, chair, uh, I reflected on what it meant to become a citizen and it was intensely powerful. And so I think that there is something, at least for me, in what, um, what Obama articulated in that, uh, in that speech. Um, it was a, a very emotional time. I should say, by the way, that I still retain my Swedish passport, so I have both. <laughs> Gets me a little bit confused on some trips when I've presented one and then I have to present the other. Um, but I'm also skeptical. So let me turn to that for a moment. I'm skeptical on several grounds, even as I acknowledge that Americans believe these claims to be true, um, and that this belief matters in, in historical terms. Perception can be reality, and that's something we can come back to if you're interested. Um, so it matters that Americans believe in their superiority. They believe that the United States is exceptional in important ways. What I'm going to focus on here is my own field of specialization, which is foreign policy. So my, my remarks will be, will be centered on that. And I want to have maybe four or five points that I mention here, indicating again my skepticism about the notion. First, there's nothing all that exceptional about American exceptionalism. Most great powers have considered themselves to be superior to their rivals, have, have believed that they were advancing some greater good when they imposed their preferences on others. Uh, the British, for example, thought they were bearing the white man's burden. That's a phrase that I'm sure you've heard, Rudyard Kipling. French colonialists believed in a civilizing mission uh, to justify their empire. And as Dave mentioned in his introduction, I've written a book, Embers of War, which is really about early US involvement in Vietnam, how the war happened for Americans in Vietnam. But in particular, in the course of doing that, it's centered on the French-Indochina War. Because as you know, before Americans fought a war in Vietnam, the French did. And I argue in the book that understanding the, the American War requires that we have a very uh, sound grasp or that we explore this French experience. And what you see when you go to the French archives, uh, the colonial archives in Aix-en-Provence, not, not a bad place to go and do research, uh, or uh, in Paris, also uh, the Foreign Ministry Archives at the Quai d'Orsay, another uh, uh, hardship post. Uh, <laughs> but what you see when you go and look at those materials it, that, is that the French believed, and I think sincerely because some of these documents are just for internal, they're secret documents. The French believed that in fact they were going to bring civilization to the Indochinese people, to the Vietnamese, to the Cambodians, to the Laotians. Uh, and that part of the reason why they had to be in Vietnam was to bring that superiority of French civilization to the Vietnamese. Ironically, and I, I wish I could spend more time on this this morning, but um, Vietnamese nationalists, revolutionaries, including Ho Chi Minh, bought into this, at least to an extent. So Ho, to a fascinating degree, had a love-hate relationship throughout his life. Um, and when he was in the jungle, fighting for Vietnamese independence. He would have books of French poetry with him, and he would, uh, he would read French literature. And when he was in Paris, he often talked about how it was the city in which he felt most at home. Um, 
but my point here is simply that other great powers have uh, seen themselves as exceptional. And so when Americans proclaim themselves to be that, to be indispensable, they are, I think, simply the latest nation to sing a familiar old song. Among great powers, thinking you're special is the norm, not the exception. You're the top dog, and you think, hey, I'm top dog for a reason, uh, and I deserve this. Second, <coughs> History, I think, does not support the contention. Uh, this one is a bit more controversial. You can shoot at me from all sides in the Q&A. History doesn't support the contention that the United States has behaved better, by and large, than other nations do. The United States, I will suggest or concede, uh, allow at the outset, the United States has not been as brutal as the worst states in world history, by any means. Uh, I may come back, to this, uh, come back to this point, but a dispassionate look at the historical record, I think, refutes, certainly problematizes uh, most claims regarding America's moral superiority. For starters, the United States has been one of the most expansionist powers in modern history. It began, as we all know, as 13 small colonies cling clinging to the eastern seaboard. But eventually, it expanded across North America, and then, uh, to, to an extent at least, uh, uh, globally. The United States has fought numerous wars since then, uh, starting several of these wars. And its wartime conduct, I think, has been uh, hardly a, a model of restraint. So for example, the conquest of the Philippines in 1899 to 1902, roughly, um, by most historians' estimates, killed some 200, between 200,000 and 400,000 Filipinos. Many of them, uh, if not an absolute majority, then a very high minority of them, uh, uh, civilians. In the so-called Good War of World War II, um, not a notion that I necessarily, uh, a, a title that I necessarily oppose, but in World War II, the United States and its allies did not hesitate to engage in massive aerial bombardment of enemy territory, killing hundreds of thousands of German and Japanese civilians in the process. <coughs> many of these campaigns, by the way, and again, historians have established this, many of these were deliberate campaigns uh, against enemy cities. It wasn't inadvertent killing of civilians in that respect. Vietnam, which is the subject that I know uh, best, um, I thought in graduate school that I would one write, uh, write one study of the Vietnam War, and that was going to be my dissertation. And here I am, uh, 25 years later, still researching the war. But in Vietnam, the United Stra States dropped more than 8 million tons of bombs uh, on Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam between 1962 and 73, um, including napalm and lethal the defoliants like Agent Orange. And though it's impossible to uh, to come up with, with accurate figures. The best, uh, the best analysis that I've seen suggests that about two million civilians on the ground in Vietnam in particular, uh, secondarily in Cambodia and Laos, and, and, uh, Cambodia and Laos um, some two million civilians uh, died in that war. Um, we could point to other examples here. The United States uh, talks a good game on human rights and international law, uh, international law, but it has refused to sign many human rights treaties, um, has, not been, uh, has been quite willing through its history to cozy up to dictators uh, with abysmal human rights records. Again, the United States did not conquer a vast overseas empire uh, uh, that caused millions to, to die through tyrannical acts in the way that obviously uh, tyrants like dictators like Stalin uh, or Mao have done. Nothing remotely like it. Given the vast power at its disposal, I think this is an important point, given the vast power at its disposal, for much of the past century, this really has been the, the American century since really really for the last hundred years, since World War I. <clears throat> Given that vast power, the United States could certainly have done much worse. And this is, again, an important point to remember. But my point here under this second heading is that the record, I think, is quite clear. U.S. leaders have done what they thought they had to do when confronted by external dangers. 
They paid scant attention in doing so to moral principles um, along the way. And the idea that the United States is uniquely virtuous may be comforting to all of us in this room, may be comforting to Americans, but I don't think it stands up to dispassionate scrutiny. Third, the third myth of American exceptionalism, uh, exceptionalism that I think is difficult to sustain is that America's success is due to its special uh, genius. There's some truth to this, again, I would say, in terms of American history. But we should not underestim underestimate the importance of luck, um, something that historians don't spend a lot of time on. Uh, we should not underestimate the importance of geography, as I suggested earlier, in what the United States has been able to achieve. It's not an accident that immigrants came to the United States in droves, and I'm going to come back to this point later. Um, it's not an accident that the melting pot, the melting pot notion facilitated the assimilation of each wave of new Americans. The United States had astonishing scientific and, uh, scientific and technolo technological achievements that were fully deserving of praise and that owed something to the openness and vitality of the U.S. political order. I think that's all true. Um, and I'm going to say just a few words about that in a moment. But America's past successes did have also something to do with, again, the, the, the particular geography in which the nation uh, found itself, the, the geographic kind of situation uh, that it found itself. Geography can be destiny, ladies and gentlemen, I firmly believe. <coughs> a fourth myth would be this, or we, maybe we would pose as a question. Isn't it the case, some of you might be thinking, that the United States has been responsible for a lot of the good in the world? Again, there's something to this line of argument. The United States has made undeniable contributions to peace and stability in the world over the past century, including the Marshall Plan after World War II, the creation and management of the Bretton Woods system, also right in the aftermath of World War II, its rhetorical support for the core principles of democracy and human rights, and its mostly stabilizing military presence in Europe and the Far East. But the belief, that's all true, but the belief that all good things flow from Washington's wisdom, I think overstates the U.S. contribution by a wide margin. I thought about this recently when I watched again what I think is a great motion picture, and that is Saving Private Ryan. <coughs> great film in many respects. But you could conclude from watching Saving Private Ryan, I think some of you know where this is going, that the U.S. played far and away the central role in the defeat, in the vanquishing of Nazi Germany. Whereas, in fact, most of the fighting was in Eastern Europe, uh, and the main burden of fighting, uh, uh, of defeating Hitler's war machine, war machine was borne by the Soviet Union. I don't necessarily fault Steven Spielberg for failing to, to, to engage this, because he had a particular film to make. My point is simply that watching that film, uh, one could conclude, uh, again, that the U.S. role, important though it was, was, uh, was absolutely the most decisive. Similarly, th though the Marshall Plan and NATO played important role, roles in Europe's post-World -war, War II success, Europeans themselves, it seems to me, deserve at least as much credit for rebuilding their economies, constructing uh, a novel and economic, uh, uh, economic and political union, and moving beyond four centuries of sometimes bitter rivalry. Americans also tend to think that they won the Cold War all by themselves. This is a subject that's a bit closer to home in that much of my research as a historian has been on the Cold War era. But I think that view ignores the contributions of other uh, anti-Soviet adversaries and the courageous dissidents. If we think about the end of the Cold War, absolutely astonishing series of developments, as you know, in the 1980s in particular. Those courageous dissidents who resisted communist rule through what became known as the Velvet Revolutions uh, of 1989 deserve a great deal of the credit for what occurred. 
Moreover, the spread of liberal ideals is a global phenomenon with roots in the, enli in, in the Enlightenment, and European philosophers and political leaders did much to advance the democratic ideal. Similarly, the abolition of slavery and the long effort to improve the status of women in the world owe uh, as much or more to, to Britain and other democracies as to the United States, where progress in both areas trailed many other countries. Finally, any honest accounting of the past half century must acknowledge the, the downside of American primacy. The United States has been uh, the major producer, at least until recently, of greenhouse gases, um, certainly for the last, if you look over the last hundred years, um, is thus a principal cause of the adverse changes that are altering the global environment. The U.S. stood on the wrong side of the long struggle against apartheid in South, of South Africa and has backed, as we all know, plenty of in unsavory characters in world affairs, including Saddam Hussein for a long time, um, again, when America's short-term interests dictated as much. You could argue, by the way, that from a realist foreign policy perspective, it was the right, it was the sensible thing to do. That the United States should be backing dictators in certain instances. That it made sense in the course of the 1970s and 80s to back Saddam Hussein. Um, my point simply here is that it would make the United States very much like other great powers and not exceptional. Last point I want to consider here in this, um, and then I want to conclude and turn to, to discussion. Um, the last point is that there's a belief that the United States has a divinely ordered or di divinely ordained mission to lead the rest of the world. What about that? I would say that confidence is a valuable commodity for any country, but when a nation begins to believe that it cannot fail um, or uh, can only fail if it's been led astray by, by you know, by traitors, by, by scoundrels, then reality is likely to de deliver a swift rebuke. Ancient Athens, Napoleonic France, Imperial Japan, Three examples that come to mind, uh, or, or, or empires that have succumbed to this sort of hubris, uh, nearly always with catastrophic results. And this may be, by the way, what Vladimir Putin, Russian president, had in mind when he chastised, some of you will remember this perhaps, he chastised President Obama for invoking exceptionalism in support of mili military intervention in Syria. So that now I'm going back again to just about six, seven months ago, uh, during the, uh, the, the debate over Syria. This is what Putin had to say. My working and personal relationship with President Obama is marked by growing trust. I'm not sure he'd say that today, by the way. <laughs> In fact, I know that he wouldn't. I appreciate this. I carefully studied his address to the nation on Tuesday, and I would disagree with a case he made on American exceptionalism in which he stated that the United States policy is what makes America different. It's what makes us exceptional. That was a quote from Putin. He was quoting the president. It is extremely dangerous, Putin went on to say. It ex it's extremely dangerous to encourage people to see themselves as exceptional, whatever the motivation. There are big countries and small countries, rich and poor, those with long democratic traditions and those still finding their way to democracy. Their policies differ too. We are all different, but when we ask, Vladimir Putin said, when we ask for the Lord's blessings, we must not forget that God created us equal, unquote. So that was Putin in September um, 2013. But I don't want to give Vladimir Putin the last word. <laughs> so I'm going to conclude by again just referring a little bit or talking a little bit about where we find ourselves today in April of 2014. Given the many challenges that Americans now face, the persistent unemployment, uh, economic difficulties that many Americans have and that the nation as a whole has, given the burden of winding down a long war in Afghanistan, and I noticed this morning that five NATO troops uh, were killed today in, Af in Afghanistan, 
it's unsurprising, given the challenges that we face, that many people find inspiration in the notion of exceptionalism. It's comforting. Um, nor, therefore, should it be uh, surprising that politicians who are ambitious and who want to win political office have been pro proclaiming exceptionalism, U.S. exceptionalism, with increasing fervor. So the exceptionalism argument, I think, offers voters a, a reassuring counter-narrative to persistent joblessness, long-term hollowing out of the middle class in the United States, a sense that the nation's best days are behind it. And I think this kind of patriotism has its benefits, um, but not when it leads to a basic misunderstanding of America's role in the world. This is exactly how bad decisions, it seems to me, get made, uh, get made. But again, it's a mixed picture. And I also want to suggest to you yet again that I, Fred Logeval, believe that in certain respects this country um, is exceptional. I think, for example, about the fact that the United States has the world's largest economy, the world's leading universities including the one that you're in right now, many of its biggest companies. The U.S. military is also incomparably more powerful than any rival. We spend, depending on how you judge it, more than the rest of the world combined, or certainly more than the next several leading powers combined in terms of military uh, expenditures. But there are also, also America's intangible assets. And these are so interesting to me. The country's combination of entrepreneurial flair and technological prowess has allowed it, as I suggested earlier, to lead the technological revolution. I think that remains true. Talented immigrants still flock to U.S. shores today. In fact, we know that as I speak, thousands upon thousands are trying to get into the United States. And we know also that the country's soft power, which is a concept I haven't really talked about today, but it's really these intangible assets. They remain very potent uh, um, uh, entities. And I believe, by the way, that I, cred or I credit Barack Obama, who I would say by and large has done a good job in foreign policy. I think Obama believes in the power of that soft, uh, he believes that that so soft power is a great asset. For all of his troubles, Polls show that Barack Obama is still the most charismatic leader in the world. Um, China's Xi Jinping doesn't even come close. America also boasts the global allure of its creative industries, <coughs> excuse me, Hollywood uh, and so on. Its values, the increasing universality of the English language, uh, and the attractiveness, uh, if somewhat in somewhat diminished form, of the American dream. It remains the linchpin of the international community. Through hard-nosed diplomacy, economic pressure, and the specter of military action, Washington has retained its ability to marshal effective multinational uh, coalitions, bringing down, for example, Libya's Muammar Gaddafi, getting weapons inspectors on the ground in Syria, and embarking on a serious program, and I hope this succeeds, to curb Iran's nuclear weapons program. By the way, parenthetically, another thing that I think uh, Obama has done right he has articulated the power of diplomacy and his faith in negotiations, including with adversaries, which I think is something that has been too often missing in American diplomacy. Um, more broadly and most important, the United States is blessed with a superior combination of sound fundamentals in demography, geography, higher education, and innovation. And I think it ensures that it's not necessarily the case that America's best days are behind it. It has the people, ideas, and security to thrive at home and on the world stage. Our, our geopolitical situation, people, is in many respects remarkably secure. Uh, and that's something we can, we can discuss. And there's a reason elites around the world remain eager to send their fortune and often their families to the United States. By the way, we see this at Cornell in the astonishing and continual rise in the number of international applicants we have uh, and uh, the willingness of many of those applicants or their parents to fully fund their education. Uh, I mean, these are uh, elites around the world who want to send their daughters and their sons to Cornell for their educations. 
And there's even truth here to this notion of the indispensable nation. Uh, and I'll conclude uh, here. I think to a large extent, it is American clout that keeps the sea lanes open around the world. Seventh Fleet, uh, to be sure, in, 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 in key parts of that world. But American clout that keeps the sea lanes open, that keeps borders respected. This is the biggest challenge, it seems to me, by the way, that, that Vladimir Putin's actions uh, are posing. And that international law be broad, broadly observed. Critics of U.S. primacy and of Western moralizing, and I consider myself among those critics on many occasions, should note, I think, that they would find Vladimir Putin's new world order much worse. Small countries, such as my native Sweden, thrive in this system that has been created, at least in part, by, uh, by the United States. An, a system of rules, however imperfect many of those rules might be. Um, if might is right, if might is right, these small nations have much to fear, especially if they must contend with an aggressive regional power such as Russia. And if you know your geography, that you know my, my, native, my native land, Sweden, is, is close uh, to, to, to Russia. Larger states, too, will lose in a system in which international agreements lose all meaning and in which unilateral secession is acceptable. But finally, let us also consider this. The challenge thus, challenges that the United States faces today are significantly more complex, more global than those of previous decades. No longer can these challenges be addressed unilaterally or even bilaterally. Pandemics, terrorism, environmental change, and energy and other resource constraints must be countered, it seems to me, regionally or multilaterally. America is a necessary but not sufficient actor. Furthermore, the responses to those challenges must be more diverse than before, uh, both with regards to levers of action, such as diplomacy, military, and economic development, um, and other types of actors like corporations, nonprofits, civil society, and foundations must also be thinking about this differently. Today's challenges therefore require that the United States uh, it requires the U.S. to work with other states and non-state actors around the world. We cannot, as Americans, impose solutions, if we ever could. We cannot do anything other than coordinate with others to, 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 to work with them and to support them. And if this tempers to some extent, ladies and gentlemen, our, our faith in the notion of American exceptionalism, then I think that might not be such a bad thing. And I thank you. I, th I think if I'm correct, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, comments? Yes, in the back. Are you, uh, first of all, thank you. Are you uh, optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the United States? Um, you know, it's, I, I, depends, I suppose. Classic, classic professor's response to, to a, a question. Um, I think that the Ukraine crisis is a very serious one. I know that there are some analysts who are basically dismissive uh, and who say that um, uh, it's really not a big concern to, to the United States or to its allies that Putin is doing this. Um, but I think, as I suggested a moment ago, especially if Putin uh, uh, wants to continue to expand his, um, uh, his efforts, that it has the potential to be very serious. I don't think we can have a situation in which um, basic notions of the, regarding the sanctity of borders uh, and the flouting of international law um, can, um, can be allowed to occur. I, my own view is that the administration to this point has handled it more or less correctly. I think that Crimea, with all due respect to Crimeans, did not rise to the level of a top drawer U.S. Uh, security interest. Um, and so I think that the administration was correct to focus on other means to, to try to, to isolate uh, the Russians. But, you know, it's just going to be so interesting and so important to observe what 
um, what Putin chooses to do, to what extent he and his principal subordinates are um, shackled by the efforts to, uh, to um, restrain him, how will the Europeans respond? And you saw, and I think it was this morning's New York Times, if you had a chance to look, that major European corporations are not wanting very tough sanctions because they're so dependent on trade with the Russians. Um, so how's that for a non-committal response? <laughs> yes? Related, was Hillary Clinton incorrect to liken Putin's move mm. to the Ukraine to Hitler's move to the East? Well, yes. Oh, yes, she was. Yes, I, I um, uh, you know, uh, I regretted when I read that Hillary Clinton had made that comparison. Superficially, and maybe that's not, maybe that's the wrong word, there is, a, a, there is a certain similarity. I mean, if you, even in terms of the language, if you, if you look at, uh, if you compare the situation prior to Munich in 1938, and the pronouncements that the Hitler government, uh, that Hitler made, uh, you can see where there's a connection to what is now happening, both with respect to Crimea uh, and then the prospect of Putin pushing further. So I can see why she drew the conclusion, but it's also just problematic. Um, because the truth is that Hitler and the Nazis represented a kind of existential, existential threat to the United States, I think, and, and belatedly, Western powers came to realize this. I think Hitler therefore required a response that was what we ultimately saw, because you had to ultimately eradicate that regime, and you had to, what, with whatever it took, whatever means necessary, to defeat that tyranny. Um, and, you know, presidents and their advisors find it irresistible to invoke that Munich analogy, 1938. And a very interesting book could be written on the power of that Munich analogy, more broadly on analogizing by presidents, but that one in particular. And so I wasn't surprised when Hillary Clinton did this. I think it was in Los Angeles. You probably saw this a few weeks ago. But I, again, I just don't see a, a close connection. She then backtracked, as you may recall, or her aides did. They said, well, we weren't saying that, you know, this is like Hitler, uh, but she had already said it. Yeah. Yes, sir. How would you respond to the idea that the idea of American exceptionalism, while popular among X percentage of the population of the United States and American leaders, is also um, put forward by people from around the world that either want to come here, uh, by people around the world that are looking to us for help, whether they're in Syria, immigrants looking for a high-tech job or a low-wage job, uh, looking to the idea of the United States as, you know, not quote that even on the hill, but as the better place that has better ideas and safeguards for the individual. You mean that they're the ones who, are, who, are, who have the, the, the greatest faith in the idea, these people who want to come here? Well, what I'm saying is it's not just Americans and American politicians yeah. who, no. um, you know, help keep the idea of American exceptionalism, uh, exceptionalism yeah. popular, but many, many other people from around the world. Oh, I think it's a very good point, and I, 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 I hope it was at least implicit in what I was saying. That the power of that, the power, if you want to reduce it to the phrase American dream, you can, but the power of the American ideal, the, the, the nature of American institutions, the, the attractiveness of much of American political culture and, and popular culture, at least until recently, uh, is, is profoundly important. You know, my next book is going to be a biography of, of of John F. Kennedy, and it's 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 really uh, instructive to me how, in many parts of Latin America, still, and elsewhere too, uh, Kennedy has that kind of power for the people there. Uh, in part, in that case, because of um, um, Peace Corps, Alliance for Progress, some of the uh, the flawed but nevertheless meaningful. Uh, uh, endeavors of his administration. You know, I was in Paris, I may have said, you, some of you may have heard me say this before, but I was in Paris in November with my wife, just a few days before the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. And I was struck by the fact that in France, complicated relationship with the United States, but in these Parisian uh, storefronts, in these windows, 
I, we, my wife and I counted at least seven or, seven or eight uh, storefronts that had um, basically tributes to Jackie and to John F. Kennedy and his wife, um, photographs, mementos, posters, marking again this assassination, which had a global effect. So, but your point is, I think, well taken. I think it contributed to, um, uh, indirectly, at least, to my own family's decision, even though we ended up in Canada, because it was easier to, um, uh, to at that point, to, to, to enter Canada than it was the United States. It was what, I think, motivated my own parents to, to at least try this thing. We were going to go back to Sweden, and then they're back there now, my parents. But um, yeah, no, it's a very good point. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, Professor Logoval, I'm sure we'll stay for a few minutes. Yes, for those of you I who see some hands. Like to ask a couple more questions. I'm sorry to cut it a little short. I know we started a little late. We have many other exciting, wonderful things to do today. So thank you so much.